Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Lindsay McRoberts, formerly the head teacher of Duncan Vig Secondary School in East Kilbride in South Lanarkshire, and I'm joined today by Annette Alexander, who's currently the acting head teacher at Duncan Vig Secondary School. We've been asked to share some of our work on curriculum development as part of the GTCS work on ethics and leading the profession. And today we would like to just share some of our work around developing an empowered secondary curriculum. In 2019, I undertook the Excellence in Headship Masterclass programme led by Mark Priestley. The aim of this programme was to build capacity in curriculum making across Scottish school leaders and to encourage critical thinking around curriculum in Scotland. The programme signals the start of a period of reflection around curriculum practice in our school and across the wider Scottish curriculum aims. This work, whilst planned pre-pandemic, has become even more important for our school and our community as we grapple with the changes that have happened as a result of the pandemic. One of the many questions we have been asking across our school community for the past three years has been, who is our curriculum for? Addressing this question not only requires deep professional knowledge and understanding, but inevitably it demands ethical professional reasoning. Whilst it is easy to say our curriculum is for everyone who comes through our doors, the truth, often hard to hear, can often be very different. How do we know the curriculum we offer, the experiences and opportunities we give, really meet the needs and wants of all of our young people? How far is our curriculum going in ensuring success for all young people, regardless of background, ethnicity or specialist need? Some of the early work we did around this area involved us looking at learner journeys or the experience of some of our young people as they made progress through the senior phase. Annette Alexander will pick this up later. But for us as school leaders, who believed that our curriculum was broad and offered a range of opportunities, it made for sobering reading. As an experienced head teacher, I am passionate about inclusive education and have strived to ensure we adapt the curriculum offer to allow young people to achieve success in mainstream. However, on reflection, I was struck with how much of this was often an add-on. Opportunities were given through our additional support needs provision or people support. And whilst it worked well, we acknowledged there was something missing. If we could not shape a curriculum that met the needs of our young people within classrooms, there was something wrong. It really takes us back to why we are teaching what we teach. If you visit any school within Scotland, you can be sure you will see vision and values displayed on the walls around the school. Bold words such as respect, ambition, diversity. But how do those values translate into what is taught in every classroom across the school? If we want young people to understand diversity, we need to ensure our curriculum offers this, and not through a diversity unit in PSE, in every classroom for every child. How does the content of what we teach make sure that meet the aspirations of our school's vision and values? One of the sessions within the Stirling University Curriculum Masterclass struck a chord with me and is something I have used as a head teacher to generate debate with principal teachers and senior leaders since. On discussing history as a subject, Mark Priestley challenges us to think about what are the lessons young people need to know from history and why? What do we need to teach young people about to stop future genocide and make better decisions for humanity? And answering this then, why do we teach the Titanic in almost every school across the country? What is the future learning from this? How will this make society stronger, if indeed we are looking to do that? When working with teachers <clears throat> and you ask them, what are the skills and knowledge young people need to make them the better scientists of the future? many will struggle, as there has not simply been time to explore this within the profession. Why do you teach what you teach? And if you could do it differently, what would you do differently? To begin to look through a different lens at curriculum, it's important to reflect on where we have come over the last 20 years of Curriculum for Excellence. Within the senior phase, most schools across the country are well down the line in terms of their senior phase curriculum. We're beginning to see the development of learner pathways, more diverse opportunities to better meet the needs of young people. The development of foundation apprenticeships has been welcomed and is expanding year on year and has, has the increase in partnership working. The majority of schools are now engaging with the SQA framework and are thinking beyond traditional SQA portfolios. We are beginning to move away from traditional five act measures, which is allowing some schools to be more creative in their approach to provide a curriculum that allows young people to show their abilities beyond an exam. However, as a head teacher, there are important questions around how far the senior phase goes in preparing young people for life beyond school. Assessment is very exam driven, and we know, which we know is being looked at as part of the reform. 
How do we work around this just now to ensure young people are well prepared for futures that could experience several pandemics and uncertainty? Asking the questions to teachers, how different is your BGE to what it was 10 years ago? Many might say there have been changes to learning and teaching and assessment, but is it structurally the same as it was in 2004? How well does it prepare young people for the senior phase? Or in fact, does it only prepare young people for the senior phase? The OECD and the Muir report have been highlighted, have both highlighted the overemphasis on senior phase learning. How far have schools realised the flexibility and local context that CFE promised? Or in fact, does it feel like we've ever had that flexibility? For a long time, schools have spent time auditing experiences and outcomes, ensuring coverage. The focus of thinking became consumed by tick box approaches and compliance to expectations set through inspection and national guidance. Where has the time been for thinking? Interdisciplinary learning came in with a big bang, but largely disappeared in many secondary schools, especially with the development of national courses over the past few years. Where is the place of interdisciplinary learning now? If we believe in the importance of children and young people making connections with their learning, can we get back to engaging with the why and what of IDL again? The recent OECD report, whilst highlighting the positives of Curriculum for Excellence, also called for a reassessment of CFE's aspirational vision against emerging trends in education and to develop a systematic approach to curriculum review. We are at a pivotal time in Scottish education to realise these ambitions. Talk to head teachers about what it's felt like to lead through COVID, and you might be surprised at the feedback. Despite being consumed by guidance and health and safety work, there is a realisation that this period has felt more empowered as a school leader. There's been a greater focus on leading within your own community and what matters here. Less about adhering to national guidance and more about using local knowledge and networks to build forward for the future of your community. It's also allowed a sharper focus on the why are we doing this question? What is the impact likely to be? Within a time poor system that talks of catching up, it's been important to streamline what we do in schools, focusing on what matters. And this has become somewhat liberating for school leaders. In 2019, we saw the launch of the Refresh Narrative for Curriculum for Excellence across Scotland, an opportunity to refocus on knowledge, skills and attributes of Curriculum for Excellence. This refresh gives us an opportunity, along with the review of the national qualifications, to revisit our curriculum again. The Refresh Narrative lays out what we already know about CFE, but does guide us to look at the how of curriculum planning a bit more than previously. There's a refocus on the four capacities and the challenges us to think about the big ideas around curriculum making. There's an opportunity for us to go back to thinking about the big ideas, maximising opportunities that develop the four capacities for learners, making clear links to future skills, understanding and sharing the pleasures and benefits that come from learning, being clear on the knowledge and skills that underpin individual curriculum areas, being informed by a shared vision, values and aims, both locally and nationally. Understanding those drivers for improvement and how they align at national and local level. Being responsible for the development of literacy and numeracy and health and wellbeing. And ensuring that includes digital skills. When beginning this work, it's important to think about the big picture. The intention of Curriculum for Excellence. And ask yourself as school leaders, if you had to measure the success of your curriculum, not as attainment, but as against the four capacities, how well would your school do? If you took the attributes and capabilities of the four capacities and looked across these, how successful would your school be in ensuring young people can think creatively and independently, for example, or apply critical thinking in new contexts? We cannot develop a curriculum rationale without engaging with the big ideas of CFE. Ask yourself, who is our curriculum for? Who is currently benefiting from it? Are we truly inclusive in terms of the curriculum we offer? To answer these questions, you need to take a long, hard look at what you offer within your curriculum and the outcomes and experiences of your young people. Something we have really do recently done at Duncan Vick Secondary School. Strong, robust self-evaluation is key. How are you evaluating the skills young people are developing in your school? Does your attainment analysis really tell you how all young people are achieving? How do young people with additional support needs or from different ethnic minorities and backgrounds do in your school? What skills should they be developing? 
and how and who decides this. How do they, you then use all that self-evaluation information to inform the drivers for your curriculum? What does the data tell you about the school? Does your curriculum need to drive attainment? Is wellbeing a key driver in your school? For too long, we've perhaps been trying to do it all without taking the step back and thinking what is right for our school and community. And remember, it is your school and community and what makes your school unique. How do you determine what's important for your school, the values you stand for and how these shape your curriculum? For a while, we have literally drowned in guidance and advice. We have tried to do everything, but we're at a point where school leaders should be reflecting on their context and what makes your school unique. What does your data say? What does self-evaluation tell you about your school? How do you take the very best of what you are and use it to influence what you do? I recently heard a head teacher say, I'm going to start to defend what's important in my own school. And if your beliefs are based on solid self-evaluation, you'll be doing what is right for your own school. You'll be developing a curriculum that's truly empowered and that is responsive to your community. We've recently started this process at Duncan Rig over the past 18 months. Slightly crazy to do this in the middle of a pandemic, but the timing has actually given us an opportunity to think completely different about the future direction of the school. Annette Alexander will talk in more detail about the work we have started, but we are one school in one town beginning to explore the possibilities around curriculum we offer our young people. It's very early work, but already it has excited a school community and allowed us to believe new possibilities and to focus on what matters to the school community. And over everything else going on across Education Scotland at present, and as a school leader, keeping that at the centre of your thinking is the most important thing. I'm Annette Alexander, currently acting head teacher at Duncan Rigg Secondary. We are currently undertaking a curriculum review to ensure we have a curriculum that meets the needs of all learners. Over the past 18 months, we have also been reviewing our curriculum offer, structure and approach to authentic pupil voice and participation. Working with staff, parents, young people and partners to review our curriculum through self-evaluation to ensure we have a relevant, aspirational curriculum with progressive pathways for all young people. We have introduced a school improvement group, which has volunteer members from across all curricular areas of our school. This group works collegiately in reviewing our curriculum, discussing data and generating ideas in departments and then sharing this at whole school level for continuous improvement. Your context should drive your curriculum. So we have made it a focus to ensure we understand our context so we can best serve the young people in our community to develop in the four capacities. Our school improvement group has spent a considerable amount of time analysing contextualised data to deepen our understanding of our school community. Ensuring our values of ambition, respect and community are built into our rationale and reflect our ethos. To support school improvement, we have also appointed principal teachers across STEM, literacy and participation and engagement. We have looked at a range of data, including young people experiencing free school meals, care experience young people and young people with additional support needs. This information is shared with all staff, so everyone has detailed information about our young people, their progress, to assist us in removing any barriers and providing suitable support for all young people to achieve. We also have a strong focus on pupil voice and personal achievement. Seeking out opportunities to enhance our curriculum offer, increase pupil leadership and celebrate success so all young people feel valued and included in our school community. We have used a range of contextualised data including destination figures, attainment data and tracking data to inform our next steps and ensure we understand our context. Relationships are at the heart of our school community and ensuring young people are supported and have a voice in their learning is another element we are focusing on in developing our curriculum. Data has been effective in assisting us in gaining a greater understanding of our context but behind the data, we have the stories of each individual young person, so we can promote ambition for all learners. Our school improvement group has also spent time looking at various learner journeys and the young person's experiences through their time at Duncan Riggs Secondary. 
This has allowed us to reflect on our curriculum offer and ensure that we recognise that a one size fit does not take into account the diversity of our community. All of this self-evaluation has led us to move away from a traditional curriculum offer and we now have a range of national progression awards, national certificates, skills for work courses and wider achievement opportunities. Also, we have increased employer and further education partnerships. This has enabled us to develop a coherent progressive pathways across all subject areas. So we have a curriculum that meets the needs, motivates and demonstrates to learners what we value as a school. And this should not just be traditional measures. The question that was previously posed was what is the purpose of education and for who? A barrier that stifles school and teachers having autonomy and creativity over curriculum design is the accountability agenda, an unhelpful ranking of schools based on traditional measures. In addition, although attainment remains important, it does not demonstrate the full achievements of a young person. As part of our pupil participation work, we are tracking the engagement of our young people and using this information to provide support so all young people have the same access to clubs, trips and wider opportunities. We are producing achievement certificates for our S6 leavers to recognise their contribution to our school community, but also to highlight the skills each young person has developed throughout their school journey that may help them in the future. Alongside our staff school improvement group, we are redeveloping our approach to pupil voice so young people can be vital decision makers in their learning. Moving away from a traditional school council to an approach where young people can work together, ensuring all voices are heard and included in shaping our community and creating better outcomes for all young people. We are at the early stages of this, having been disrupted by the pandemic. We have established pupil ambassadors across our school with young people choosing curriculum areas of interest to represent which has already led to increased visibility and pride, increased involvement of staff working with young people on self-evaluation within department areas and young people's voice being heard. We have carried out training with our ambassadors and looked at the We Higgies self-evaluation toolkit to gain valuable information about our young people's experiences across our school community. Our plans include establishing a pupil school improvement group to work alongside our staff group so the power sharing and decision making is equal. Having recently gained our silver, silver rights respecting school, we are aiming to increase opportunities for all stakeholders to be engaged in planning school improvement. As with all schools, during the pandemic, we had to respond to the rapid changes to adapt to support our learning community. We made significant changes to our curriculum structure, which was we then consulted on with all stakeholders. And we have moved forward and retained the double period model and split our social times. This was due to the strength of feeling from all our stakeholders. Young people and parents in this consultation has driven changes across our community, which we will continue to retain. Our focus has been on well-being of all in our community during these challenging times, and we are aware that the gaps for young people will be greater than ever. The digital changes that have afforded us a new way of approaching things, including online parents night and the creation of a digital school to support vulnerable learners in their transition back to school. Our focus is now to review our approaches to learning, teaching and assessment with the opportunities double periods have created, supporting professional learning, pupil voice and building capacity at all levels. Being able to work with parents and partners again in person provides fresh opportunity to reevaluate where we are and what we want for our young people and what is important in education. <laughs>